As a financial brand marketing or sales leader, how are you consistently making new connections that lead to loan and deposit growth? More specifically, where are there opportunities right now for you to use data, more specifically customer insights, so that you can consistently deepen relationships that lead to new connections, which lead to conversations and ultimately results in loan and deposit growth? Well, let's find out together on today's episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. You're listening to the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. Welcome back to the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. I'm James Robert Lay, founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, where we help financial brands uncover their biggest marketing and sales blind spots so that they quickly stop losing loans and deposits. Before we get into today's episode, I want to invite you to join the digital growth community. Maybe you have been watching or listening to the podcast for a while, but did you know that more than 350 other growth-minded financial brand leaders have joined the digital growth community to connect, to learn, and to grow together? You too can join them right now when you text COMMUNITY to 415-579-3002. That is COMMUNITY, text COMMUNITY to 415-579-3002. Now, Joining me for today's conversation, which is part of the Exponential Insight Series, is Brian Bauer. Brian is the Chief Executive Officer of Revio, where they transform financial data into actionable growth opportunities to inform growth strategies so that community financial brands can increase their revenue and deposits. Welcome to the show, Brian. It is so good to hang out with you today, buddy. Uh, You too, James Robert. Thanks for having me. Before we get into talking about uh, deposit growth, revenue growth, using data to really help inform that growth, what is good in your world right now, personally or professionally, is your pick to get started on a positive note? Oh, man, uh, what's good in my world? Everything. I mean, it was a, it was a great summer. Uh, the kids just went back to school, so we're excited about that for sure. Uh, you know, And we're getting ready to head into the late Q3 kind of travel uh, you know, work travel, uh, as well as a little bit of uh, vacation that we're going to sprinkle in there. So I've got no complaints. Everything's great. I'm, How about you? I'm right there. What's with, going well? What's going well? Um, I'm right there with you. So the four kids, they started back in school, except this year, it's a whole new growth opportunity for the family because my oldest is a freshman. We'll have a, we have a seventh grader in junior high, a fifth grader in middle school, and then a third grader in elementary. So we are in four different schools with four very diverse schedules, very active, very involved kids. Um, And then I'm right there with you. Um, I think I have seven trips in eight weeks between September and October. So yeah, uh, the shout out to my wife, who's going to be the one who's managing all the craziness on the home front while I'm out, uh, out on the road. Yeah. Shout out to mine as well for the, for the same. So, uh, you know, you know, busy, busy life here with uh, with juggling the kids. But my my spread on the age group is not quite as lo- you know, large as yours. But my oldest just uh, entered her senior year. OK, and so uh, that is a, that's an interesting milestone as well. That is that's a whole new season, which it's crazy that we're going to be right there in four years from now. Um, and then we'll keep repeating that process, I think, every two years. Um, if everything goes as planned and the kids keep moving forward and progressing through school as they are just excelling and doing such a great job. Let's talk deposit uh, growth, revenue growth, particularly informed and inspired by data. I know that's a, something that you're going to be talking about at the upcoming ABA Bank Marketing Conference in October, October 8th at 1030 a.m. Where's the conference this year since we're talking about being on the road? Chicago. Yeah, it's at the, uh, it's at the Hyatt in, uh, in Chicago. Yeah. So if you're going to be going, uh, please uh, connect with Brian and tell him that you you heard him first on the Banking on Digital Growth podcast, because that's why we're doing what we're doing is to is to connect good people who can do even greater things together. So when it comes to turning data into deposits and revenue and growth, where do you see the big opportunity today for financial brands, not just in the present, but also looking ahead towards the future? Uh, that's a that's a great question, and you know it, it's one that is you know it, it's constantly changing, right? We're we're in a market that in the last twenty four months, I think we've seen a lot of competition heat up that you know maybe wasn't there before. Uh, you know, I think if you go back five six years, 
and you start looking at things like customer insights, I don't think it's as, in, as interesting to banks, right? Because we've not had, you know, number one, the largest banks in the country are now investing heavily in, uh, in data analytics and in their AI strategy, um, you know, and then you've got the emergence of all these fintech brands that are out there that are, you know, really just coming at the market from a lot of different angles. And the end result is ultimately the rise in customer acquisition costs, which I'm sure that is, some, is a topic that you focus on quite a bit, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with your brand work that you're doing. And, you know, where we see the opportunity is with that rise of customer acquisition costs that you have, uh, as banks, have a lot of money on the table with their existing clients. So that, you know, if you go uh, get 100 new customers, they're going to be just as profitable as the 100 before. Uh, and you, you can really start to use customer insights. And when I when I say insights, I'm not talking about personality profiles. I mean, uh, insights that we derive from the core data, from the data that banks have in their possession, that first party data to really understand where do we have these single service customers? Where do we have things like non-primary checking relationships? You know, where have we issued a loan to a commercial business? Uh, and, you know, maybe we opened up the DDA account whenever we got, we issued that loan, but we never really concentrated on capturing the deposit. So there's a lot of places where banks can look within their own universe, within their own customer base uh, to try to start to understand where that where those individual customer growth opportunities are, uh, as well as, you know, what what kind of product offering should we have? Right. Where do we have a mismatch here? Where do we have opportunity to maybe think about something new? Uh, to approach these customers with, whether it's a, you know, a, a new credit card solution or uh, a new type of loan or even a new, depo- new type of deposit account to attract the right type of customers that we're really looking to, uh, you know, to attract. Is it fair to say that the data you're looking at, this first party data, is what we would frame as thick, uh, not thick, big data. So it's informing what people are doing, their behavior, their their actions. Is, is that a fair assessment here? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and we really look at it and there's a few layers of, of data when you and it comes to banking, right? I think it's a such a nebulous term, sure. right? You know, somebody's data and it's like, you know, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, and, you know, we really look at it as customer insights. So it's not business intelligence, right? There's, you know, business intelligence is kind of, you know, strategic level, uh, you know, where are my flows? You know, what are my deposits doing? What am I paying for those deposits? And then there's also peer data that you can get out there because there's so much data available via the the UBPR data and other publicly available sources where folks will often do peer comparisons. What we're really talking about here is looking at the transactional level and looking at the customer level uh, within the bank, being able to draw conclusions as to what that customer behavior is, both on the strategic level and on the tactical level. Right. So, you know, what's happening with my customers that might uh, indicate the need uh, for a new type of product or service or where is there, you know, where are we kind of underpenetrated within that customer base, uh, you know, based upon the data and what the data tells us. Uh, And then, you know, once we kind of make a decision there, maybe we do need to launch a new product or maybe we don't. Right. We're going based off what the data is telling us, you know, which are those customers that I should be engaging and on what you know, what type of product or service, what type of message should I be sending those customers? Because, uh, you know, I did this uh, a little bit of informal study in my own customer engagement. And in the month of July, uh, I had over 100 customer engagements from all different kinds of brands. You know, everything from Amex sending me, uh, you know, high yield savings to, uh, you know, offers for commercial loans and everything in between. Uh, and, you know, community and regional banks really have to enter, I think, that conversation a little bit more uh, and understand that their customers, you know, there's competition going on all the time and it's only amping up. Uh, and the amount of offers your customers are getting are through the roof. And so if they don't know what you offer, if you're not out there proactively in front of those customers, whether it's through a digital engagement channel or it's through what we like to call the relationship channel, uh, where a lot of these community and regional banks, you know, like to differentiate themselves is, you know, on some level, it's, you know, a human is picking up the phone and actually being proactive about engaging those customers and engaging them at the right time. So community and regional banks, I think, have a huge opportunity there to, uh, you know, develop deeper relationships with their customers and, and you know, look, ultimately, it's more profitable relationships as well. Uh, but sometimes they need the guidance on where do we apply, where do we start that effort, uh, where's the biggest value, and we're really using data to bring that to the surface. 
you you made a very interesting point digital engagement versus i think you said relational engagement channel what do you mean between the two I, digital is is i would say it's it's obvious but once again it's like data i don't want to be nebulous here i want to be very specific into where where the the, the potential opportunity is but also the relational engagement um and and Give me some perspective, then I'll, I, I want to also maybe overlay that with some additional context, just based upon what I'm seeing as well. Oh, no, and, I, and I'm, I'm very much uh, interested in your uh, in your perspective on that, uh, where you're seeing the engagement and success on the digital side. But, you know, look, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of channels you can engage your customer on. Right. Uh, a lot of folks are looking at in-app types of engagement. Or, you know, when somebody lands on your website, there's, a, you know, a lot of folks are looking at, you know, how do we personalize Correct. the messaging or the marketing that those folks receive uh, when they land on the website. Um, a lot of banks are not even engaged in any kind of email marketing or, or, or be being proactive about contacting their customers at all. You know, I've, uh, I've got a bank, a fantastic bank, best service of any bank that I've ever been with. The only time I ever get any kind of message from them is when it's a federal holiday approaching and they want to remind me that I can't send wires or, you know, or, or ACH is on that day that the bank's going to be closed. And so, you know, with the amount of times your customers are being engaged by your competitors, by the largest brands in the country or fintechs that are out there, you know, that's really, I think, on the digital side where banks have to enter in that conversation and let customers know what the bank offers because banks or customers do what we all do. When we have a need, we go to Google first oftentimes. Right. And so uh, and, and we're going to Google first because we don't have the answer to the question or maybe we, we've we not they've not approached us in that on that awareness level to to let us know that the bank even offers that type of product or service. Um, and, and so customers go to Google. And a lot of times if they end up back at the bank, it's because they didn't find what they needed out there. Or they got declined. So there's a little bit of adverse selection when that if that customer eventually does come back around. And on the relationship side, it's, I mean, it's everything from a actual personal email being sent to, you know, uh, picking up the phone and calling the customer or setting meetings with those customers, which are very important, especially on the commercial and business side is, you know, that human level interaction that's happening. Because if your connection with your customer is purely and exclusively digital, uh, you know, that can be replicated uh, by Bank of America or replicated by Chime. So it doesn't, and certainly not to say that customers don't want that, uh, you know, don't want that digital convenience. That's table stakes today. Your customers demand and have to have the digital convenience, uh, but they, you know, they also want a human that they can engage with as well when necessary. It's the human experience that I'm very interested in. And, and you're like, well, that's, that's kind of, Interesting, James Robert, for those watching or listening, because I thought you were part of the Digital Growth Institute. It's all digital. Digital is is a primary touch point. It is often the initiating touch point of a shopping or buying experience for a financial product, particularly if it's a prospective or new account holder. However, back to your point, the human experience, the human relationship to me is something that I'm going to go out and make a pretty bold statement here. I think as we move further into the age of AI, we're going to see the pendulum swing away from, we'll just call it team tech to team humanity. And it doesn't mean the technology is going to go away. In fact, I think we're going to continue to see doubling down of technology um, from an adoption standpoint within financial services. However, we cannot forsake the human experience, particularly at a community financial brand level, because it is the relationships that we have that is a differentiator from other national and digital only brands. And so when you're talking about using data, data can be used to deepen the relationship, to reach out at the right time and to even ask the right questions. And it's by asking the right questions that we can surface new potential opportunities that a current account holder might not be even aware of that we can help solve a pain or solve a problem for them. And so it's the blending of the two worlds, even to the point to where when we're thinking about the digital experience, let's say we have a lender or a, a, a leader, an advisor of, of some sorts working within a financial brand and utilizing that personalized, quote unquote, one on one outreach supported by some level of automation. Um, we're seeing a lot of that within the CRM space. But something has to inform that 
activity. It just can't be, we're going to do the same thing for everyone. It has to be very specific, very bespoke, um, getting into now the conversation of ABM or account-based yep. marketing, marketing and sales right here. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, it, account-based marketing is, I think, you know, a huge opportunity for banks to embrace this concept, right? Um, especially banks that are not, you know, if you're not thinking about customer engagement, or maybe you're thinking about customer engagement, and it's very monolithic, right? Like you want to send, you know, you're thinking, hey, we need to get out and communicate with our customers. Uh, but you're not necessarily thinking about the fact that, look, we really actually need to send specific messages to specific customers, because everyone's needs are different, right? Uh, there's no use sending, uh, you know, a message about, you know, your great, you know, product or service to a customer who doesn't even have a primary checking relationship with you, right? That that individual uh, needs a specific message that is relevant to the relationship that they have with your institution because they know what the relationship is. The question is, do you know what the relationship is uh, as as the banker? And so, um, you know, I think that's a challenge for a lot of bankers, uh, and I think what we're doing is helping apply some customer level intelligence that helps them segment those customers in a way that helps describe what that customer's relationship is, what that customer thinks their relationship is with the bank and make sure that that messaging is relevant, that they're, uh, that the bank is, is showing the knowledge uh, of uh, understanding what that customer's relationship with, is with the, with the institution. And I think that's incredibly important because otherwise your customer, you run the risk of your customers tuning you out and then you lose the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to deliver a relevant message at the right time and place. I want to roll this back a little bit because um, ABM or account-based marketing might not be a generally well-known term yet within financial services. I know if we go outside of the vertical, for example, maybe SaaS, uh, software as a service, ABM might be a more well-known term. What is ABM? there's another acronym. What is account-based marketing for those that they either they they've heard of it, they're not 100% sure what it is, or this is maybe the first time that it's just popping up on their radar? Uh, well, I'd love your answer to this too. So after I give my my crack at one, but it's as close as possible to generating one-to-one -one level uh, conversations with your customer. So it's demonstrating, I think, an understanding of your customer uh, on that level and really approaching them as a customer of one. Now, it might not actually be a customer of one, right? You may be, it may be a, a segment of 500 or it may be a segment of 100. Uh, and it could be anything from, a, a, you know, a retail customer segment that you've identified that, uh, you, that you want approach in this, in this way using this methodology. Or, you know, it could be the hundred strategic accounts that you see uh, on the commercial side that, hey, we really need to you know, we really need to wrap our solution kind of around these hundred strategic accounts and approach them with a, you know, with a what is a, effectively a custom package uh, in order to earn that business. And, you know, it involves, you know, both sales and marketing, right? It's account-based marketing. So a lot of people think to marketing yes. first, but it really has to happen on those multiple levels and it's coordinated. Right. Uh, you know, you, you're, you're, do, you're running that, whether it's, it's a limited time campaign or it's a continuous campaign of engagement with those strategic customers, uh, you know, in order to, you know, open the door, gain the interest, understand that customer. And I think that's, you know, uh, I'm talking about it very much from the bank's point of view, but I think it also forces you, if you take that approach and you do it well, to understand your customer in a way uh, that maybe you don't understand it today, right? Because if you want to, if you want to get relevant to that customer, and you want to make sure that you're kind of delivering messaging that's that's really on point, it requires you to understand something about that customer in a deeper way than you might, uh, you know, using another approach. But I want to hear your perspective. You're the you're the marketer in the room, right? Well, you're, I just pretend. Well, no, this <laughs> and, but this is where this is where I think there's a lot of collaboration that can that comes out of these conversations. In, in fact, I, I want to give a specific use case of this here. Um, and, and let's look at this on the B2B side. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, small to mid-sized business, commercial. Um, expertise is going to be critical here and, and really positioning as an expert, someone that understands my unique situation. Take American Express, right? You, you're getting the offer from Amex. I'm getting the offer from Amex. But I don't know anyone at Amex, 
But then I think about some of the other institutions that I have relationships with. I actually know who's there that I can call when I have a problem. So mm -hmm. when I look at account-based marketing, you're right. I think it's a misnomer to think, oh, well, that's just a marketing activity. You know, this is marketing and sales and, and marketing and sales. And, and I wrote about this in Banking on Digital Growth. The opportunity for marketing and sales not to compete against one another, which is, I think has been the historical context here, but marketing and sales to connect and to collaborate, to, mm -hmm. to co-create value together um, mm -hmm. is, is one of the greatest future growth opportunities. Um, and the outcome of that is threefold. It's more connections that lead to deeper conversations that ultimately result in some level of commitment. And we're actually working on a new methodology. It's going to be, it's the framework for, for my next book, Banking on Expertise. And we've put a, we've put a project name on this and we've, we're calling it level up business. And it is a way for growth minded lenders, particularly on the SMB side of things to have simply conversations with ideal prospects. Those conversations then are turned into podcast conversation podcasts, like the ones that we're doing right here, which through the podcast, what are you getting? You're getting information into where their pains, questions, concerns are, where their opportunities are. You're also co-creating to go help other entrepreneurs or other, you know, commercial accounts. And as a result, you're deepening that relationship. So you're having more connections leading to more conversations, which ultimately over time will lead to a deeper level of commitment. And the first commitment could just simply be, you know what we're doing. You go in and you identify the top 100 accounts based upon data. Well, instead of just going straight to market with an offer, it's like, no, we're going to come. We're doing an industry research project. Would love to do a 15 minute interview with you. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And then from there, it's like, I love what you shared. Can we do a further follow-up? I'd love to interview you for our podcast because they're becoming the hero of the narrative and the institution and, and that SMB lender or leader is just playing the role of the helpful and empathetic guide. And so it's mm -hmm. completely transforming the dynamic of the relationship that over time, it's like, it's making a deposit. It's making another deposit. It's making another deposit into the trust fund of potential prospects or current account holders that we don't have a deep of a relationship with that the relationship is no longer transactional. It becomes transformational. You, you, you kind of beat me to that uh, on the, you know, as community banks, regional banks, it is about the relationship. And, um, and, and we say that, and I think we, we often say it and we mean it, uh, but Oftentimes, the goal-oriented approach or metric-oriented approach can drive us towards transactional behavior, even though we want to be more relational, right? Uh, and I think where account-based marketing is, is so unique and different compared to other, other approaches is it does focus on the relationship building and the relationship value and understanding your customer in a way that you didn't understand before, right? And it's the, it's the natural result of going through that process and engaging your customer on that level is more business. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's almost a, a paradoxical, right? In that you're approaching it from the relationship standpoint and remaining focused on the relationship standpoint, but the natural outcome of that is more business. But if you try to approach it for the business, you might, and you approach it transactionally, you might not end up with the business at all. You know, because for a lot of reasons, right? Because you, you didn't seek to understand the customer, maybe, right? Uh -huh. You didn't seek to take that information back and turn that into product and offering, right? Because that all feeds, it all feeds on itself, right? And you, you said something the other day that uh, I caught you on, uh, you know, uh, on the podcast here. Uh, and you were talking about why would somebody, why would somebody want to buy or why would somebody want to open up a checking account with our institution, right? It's a profound question. And it's a question that doesn't get asked often enough. And I think that's why you're asking it. You're posing that question. And, you know, through an account-based marketing style approach, uh, you know, you can come to that answer, right? You can ask yourself that question and understand the customer's perspective and force yourself into their perspective and, the natural result of that is answering the question 
And then the natural result of answering the question is gaining or earning the business, right? Earning the business. You talk about this idea of understanding, and it reminds me of some ancient wisdom to where, uh, and, and some might know this, it's helped me to not so much seek to be consoled as to consult, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. And it, it really is a, a flip of the relational model and we are taking, we're helping first and then we're selling second. Um, it's also, it's, it's, it's foregoing the macro to focus on the micro. And I do believe in the age of AI where human connection has the potential to, to have a perceived higher value. Um, and it's all perception that the micro has the potential to beat the macro even for that matter. Um, but it's the, it's the work that you're doing that's providing the insights to then have the deeper level micro conversations that creates a greater impact and a greater value for prospective account holders. Um, and then as a result, create value for the, the organization. What is it that holds financial brands back from realizing the potential here? What's the biggest impediment or the biggest roadblock when it comes to we'll just say ABM or using uh, customer insights to deepen relationships and ultimately grow deposits and loans? Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things uh, that, I mean, it's a good question. There's a couple of things there, you know, one is our, you know, one of them is our confidence in ourselves, right? Um, can we get out and engage these customers in a way that's going to generate results? And if you're, and if you, if you're thinking about, you know, this quarter, Right. Well, how many? What are the deposits we're going to put on this quarter? Uh, then I think you are thinking about it. And, you know, a person's thinking about it incorrectly at that point in time. Right. It's about you know who, who do we engage uh, and, and develop that relationship with. You know, I've heard bankers uh, talk about you know on the data. You know, will the customer move their deposits off the book? Those deposits are gone. I can't. You know, I can't get them anymore. And it's like, well, that's the that would be the 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 transactional frame of reference. Right. Where uh, where, you know, the value of that customer is really the transaction of the deposits moving off the book and not the idea that, you know, this is a customer that's a high value client. Uh, they had enough to move off the book that it mattered, you know, and, you know, you should find out more about them and about what their needs are, because if nothing more. Right. In engaging that customer, you learn something. Right. You learn something from that customer. You understand why they went to the competition versus you. Maybe it was rate. Maybe they're rate sensitive and that's it. And, you know, and they really cared about the yield. Maybe it's because they didn't even know that you had anything to offer at the bank because nobody had been proactive about reaching out. Sure. But that conversation is meaningful, right? A human connection is meaningful. And they're going to think about you next time. And I think about the person I get my mortgage from uh, who religiously sends me a note every year on my birthday. Right. A handwritten note. It's a real handwritten note. It's not the fake one. And they just maintaining that top of mind with me. Now, you know, he knows I'm getting a mortgage this last year. He sold me my last one. It's like at 2.9 percent. So there's no way I'm getting a new mortgage. But religiously, he sent me that that handwritten note and remains top of mind, uh, you know, for me. So he, he's, he's engaging me on a human level with a handwritten note. Nobody does that. Right. You got all these digital channels out there that are just bombarded and here he decides to tune in on a handwritten note channel and you know and that becomes unique on that level i think the second thing that holds bankers back um is confidence in the offering right what what do we all in and you know i've i've said this many times to anybody that would listen but if you if you feel insecure about what the offering is then that's your first sign right if you feel insecure about what you're selling uh, you know, to your customer, then that's the first sign that you need to take a look and reflect upon what the offering is, um, uh, you know, and, and, and determine whether or not the offering really matches what the customer's needs are. If you made an arbitrary decision years ago to, you know, let's say partner with a certain credit card company, and that's now the card product that you offer, but you know, your customers don't like it. And so you feel uncomfortable engaging your customers to cross promote that type of product then you need to look internally and say, okay, well, why is that the case, right? Do we need to go to the drawing board? Do we need to understand our customers better in order to get a product or service that matches what their needs are more closely? Because if you, if you do have that and you have something that your customers need and value, then you should feel comfortable push, you know, uh, getting in front of those customers and pushing that product out into the world and talking about it. Um, and so, you know, as an entrepreneur, this has always, you know, kind of been my, it's almost my litmus test, right? 
if, you know, if we launch a new insight and I don't feel comfortable about it and I don't feel comfortable about talking about it. Now, if I didn't feel comfortable about getting in front of a customer with it, that means it's not good enough. And we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to continue to work. Right. So that's my own personal litmus test that I use sure. kind of in, in my. I, I like those examples and I want to go back to the idea of uh, your mortgage lender with the handwritten note. It, it comes back to that three C's model that I was mentioning. Connections lead to conversations. Conversations lead to commitments. Well, you already gave them a commitment. You did your mortgage with them at 2.9. Like you said, you're not going to do another mortgage right now. However, However. He's, he's still making connections mm -hmm. that when the time is right, it will transpire into another conversation that has the potential to yield another commitment. So mm -hmm. it's a long game here as well. And I think any type of transformational relationship, it is a long game. It's not something yeah. that transpires in 30 days or you send an email or you place an ad or you put an offer out there. You, you might, I mean, if particularly in the B2B space, I mean, if you think about it, it's like, uh, the anecdotal data is like they're, you know, 3% of, of, of businesses are market ready for your offer. Well, the other 97%, that's relationship at that point. You're, you're having mm -hmm. to make deposits into the trust funds of people and that trust fund sits between their ears. And sometimes it can take weeks, months, even years of placing deposits. But ultimately, just like any investment, there will be a payoff uh, to that. Uh, the, the long game of that relationship building and that that's back to that paradox, right? Is if you're willing to invest in that and look, you invest in that because you care, right? You inv you're investing in that, that relationship because you actually care about the customer and, and you, you want to see the customer do better and you want to have things that are valuable for your customer because you want to serve them better. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're doing those things and if you're caring and you're marching down that pathway, it's not going to be something that you went over. Right. Right. It's not going to be next week. It's not going to be this quarter. It might not even be next quarter, but you're planning that, you know, you're planting those seeds of relationship and you're cultivating those relationships over time and the inevitability. And I really like to talk about it as an inevitability because it is an inevitability. If you're authentic to what your mission is and your brand. Right. And I know you talk about this a lot about, you know, back to that. Why would somebody open up a checking account at this institution? Right. If you're if, and if you really answer that question and you mark or you walk that path, the inevitability is winning more business uh, because, it, you know, in my in my life, the, you know, my experience is that's that's it's almost a law of nature. Right. Yeah. Uh, you invest in the relationship and those will eventually return back. And, you know, it's I, I, why I think what you know, one of the things you're doing here with this, uh, you know, with this podcast is, is so, you know, is so great because you're you're leading with the give. You know, you're leading with a give and the give is knowledge uh, and it's so valuable to gain insight. And, you know, uh, luckily you have a lot of other people on here, except for my, you know, besides myself, who can actually share something really profound with your audience. Uh, you know, <laughs> you, the other folks that you have on the show, but it's, it's, it's leading with a give of some insight. And, you know, that, that it's always good to lead, lead with that kind of give. Well, so. I, I really appreciate that, but I also have to just have some full disclosure and honesty and truth here there's a little bit of selfishness to this. And what I mean is I learn so much. Like I am a student. And I mean, just in the conversation today with you, Brian, it's like, I have learned so much. You've helped to me see things differently. And I know that seeing things differently is the first step of human transformation. And so I, I love to give, I love to share. I love to elevate. I love to see others like yourself, be able to communicate and help others see things differently. But I'm not gonna lie. I love learning too. And so I, I, I scratched this itch and, and to your point, it's around knowledge. There's a knowledge transfer that's going on here. And when you go back to the question, why should I open an account or apply for a loan at, at your financial brand? And it's all the same you know, type of a perspective or the same type of narrative that's shared. That's an internal belief. And if that's the internal belief, then we know that the belief is going to drive the action externally. It's going to drive the behavior externally. What I do see is missing though, and it is the most profound growth opportunity. It comes back to the, the three, three C's that we've been talking about. It, it will lead to more connections that lead to more conversations that lead to more commitments. The lack or the lack of perspective, the lack of belief is why someone should open an account is because of our knowledge. It's because of our expertise. It's because of our experience. 
And I do believe that for the financial brands that unlock, capture, and amplify that, whether that's at a macro level or it's more in an account-based marketing and sales perspective, that's a way to differentiate in you know from the 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 masses in the sea of sameness to really truly say you know what we have knowledge we have expertise uh, and that expertise can guide you forward beyond your current state to help you achieve your goals to help cure your pains so that you can realize a bigger better and brighter future as we wrap up here Brian what is one thing that someone who is watching or listening can do next on their own journey of growth to apply the thinking that you have shared here today so they can take some action. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to say that it's don't wait for perfection to engage your customers, right? Uh, you know, uh, I talk to a lot of bankers who, um, you know, they're waiting for, oh, we need a CRM or we need, you know, we need this next, you don't even need Revio Insight to engage your customers, right? The exercise of getting out and engaging your customers is going to be a learning experience. And if you do so and approach it from that relationship building standpoint, you're going to do what you just said, which is you're going to learn a lot uh, and you're going to be able to bring that information back. So I think that is the, you know, uh, you know, pick up the phone and call a customer or send an email and send an appointment and and have a conversation with somebody um, and and w- and without expectation. Right. Because I think that's that's kind of the, that's kind of the magic there uh, that will eventually lead to the outcomes that you're looking for if you're trying to grow the business. And, you know, another thing I'll say here is just on brand. Right. And I know you talk brand a lot. And I think that, you know, brands are something and you touched on this, right? It's it's not just about what the market believes about you, but it's about what you believe about yourself. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, bankers in the space don't recognize that enough uh, when it comes to brand. You know, I, I, I talk to folks, you know, all across the board and, you know, you ask them what a brand is and they might just point to the logo. And, uh, you know, and it's it, that the logo doesn't carry meaning, right? If it, and if it doesn't carry meaning, then it's not a brand. And so investing in the brand of the organization really helps on that account based marketing approach to bring some insight to your customer as to what the bank's all about, what the values are of the institution. So that way they can have some assumptions whenever somebody engages with you uh, or engages with them from the bank. Uh, they already know something about the bank and what the bank stands for and what the bank means. And that really helps so much in, in the effectiveness of something like an account-based marketing uh, approach, right? They work in tandem. They're not independently. They don't work necessarily independently. Uh, they are more effective because of each other mm. uh, if, if you're the right investment there. And so, uh, and, and, and on the learning front, I appreciate what you're doing. I, I learn all the time. Every time I uh, am scrolling down my LinkedIn feed, there's always a reason to stop for 60 or 90 seconds and catch one of your clips. Uh, and so, uh, you know, appreciate what you're doing out there to you know, spread the gospel because I think this is somewhere I don't want to live in a world where there's only, you know, 10 mega institutions, right? Uh, I want to live in a world where we continue to have vibrant community banks that are the backbone of uh, of our country and our economy. They're a strategic differentiator for our economy. Uh, and so anyone who's looking to help community banks continue to grow uh, and stay competitive in the market uh, and is a friend of community banks is a friend of mine. And so I appreciate what you're doing to spread the knowledge and love. Well, I'm right there with you. Um, community financial brands are the backbone of the local economy. And that's how we all continue to grow and level up together, just as we've done here today, Brian. You talk about learning. If someone who is watching, listening, uh, they want to continue the conversation we've started here today, what is the best way for them to reach out, connect, say hello to you? Yeah, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, search me on LinkedIn or go follow Revio Insight. And you'll find me through there uh, or go to RevioInsight.com and uh, you know uh, check out a little bit about the company and who we are. Connect with Brian, learn with Brian, grow with Brian. Brian, thanks for joining me for another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. This has been so much fun today, buddy. Now, thank you. Thanks for having me. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, and be the light.